Hello, my name is Norma Echeverria and uh, this video today is a part of my personal journey once I just started and the issue I want to talk about this one is uh, where are adults with ADHD? Uh, are they hidden? Uh, if I ask a question to a psychiatrist that is clinical trained and I ask them how many patients with ADHD adults do you have? And say, no, I don't have any. So it's a, come on, 4.4 of the population, that's the prevalence rate for ADHD in adulthood, is affected and you don't see one? So uh, then that's, that's truly a statistic. So I would say, why are they undiagnosed? Why do they remain undiagnosed being so severely affected? So. I am trying to make a point on that and I listen to others explanation first people saying you know what <laughs> that does not exist ADHD is uh, not a real disorder it's a fake disorder those are myths but you can also listen to that part and then other there are other professionals that happen to know how a kid or ADHD is looking like in childhood because there are more and more deficient about this and so they blame these adults for not being seeking for help they say you know what they are so disorganized they are so affected by all this chaotic life uh, and they're employed and they're achieving and they're educated they are not having uh, any health insurance so they are not seeking for help and that blames them again. And I, I just don't like it because a person that grew with ADHD has been blamed since they remember, blaming for being responsible, for getting late, for being stigmatized, for lazy. Uh, I, I don't feel that that's, that's really accurate or, or I, I don't like that. So let's move from that and say, you know what? Uh, we know it's a validated diagnosis, so sometimes it's like you cannot uh, find what you're not looking for. And uh, when you don't know what you're looking for, how are, the hell are you going to find it? So we are not uh, trained even to know how an adult with ADHD would express their suffering, their disorder daily. So I would say that's easy. So then let's go out and train a clinical psychiatrist or all the professionals in mental health about how ADHD looks like. And that, well, that would be the answer. And in my personal perspective, because I've been trying so hard uh, working with adults, psychiatry or young people, trying to encourage them to learn and to do this, which I, it's my practice for 20 years, I find a lot of resistance. And uh, then my thought came and said, you know what, we're trained to recognize depressive symptoms, anxiety disorders, because all those disorders, and I could mention the whole DSM-5, uh, are coming, are appearing, affecting a person that was normally neurodeveloped. So they are affecting a, a brain as a normal developed brain in the same way or more or less it's a time of degrees but they are going to look much alike so you can recognize something that is always more or less the same showing the same but you know what for 20 years working with ADHD I never had two adults expressing their ADD in the same way so that would be something very important because how are you going to teach to recognize something that is always going to be different. So this also into subject variability we're talking about today is going to be making it more and more difficult. So how does an adult with ADHD look like? So if, if we have to train people, we have to know how do they look like? And here comes what I think is the clue for this. This is my personal view, I am a psychiatrist, but I also live with ADHD. I never knew ADHD was a disorder, even I was living with it. And so I say, this is a genetical inheritable disorder, 0 0.8. Uh, inheritance is a lot. So what we inherited uh, is a 
possible uh, expression for a disorder. We inherited the possibility to express it, but we know this genes could be different and then we could inherit it, um, an affection in the dimension of the cognition and then we have more disattentive symptoms or maybe we do have problems with the inhibition dimension. So the networks are going to be differently affected and also in severity amount because this is not an all or nothing. This disorder is about a uh, spectrum. It's not like being pregnant. It's not you are or you are not. You can be differently affected by this intensity of the symptoms. And the second point that for me is amazingly important is that as a neurodevelopmental disorder, you have the genes and you display all this uh, dysfunction and then the environment responds. And uh, physically, the environment is important because if you are born outside in the fields and you have a lot of space to run and to climb, as I did when I was a young girl, uh, that makes you feel good and not being criticized or blamed because you're breaking things or just moving around. Or maybe you have a chance to be born in a family that is very sport friendly and then you develop the, the possibly amazing thing of just starting a sport, if you have the skills and you have this possibly um, uh, dimension open for you. So even that is important. Uh, if your parents are in a very good income position, maybe you can go to a better school, you have better offers, you can learn an instrument, or maybe you like music, or maybe you have trips where you can learn history and geography. It's not just the books. So I would say, we can know that neurodevelopmental disorders will be different because that's not the case of depressive symptoms, of, ins of insomnia, of anxiety. So I would say if you have a neurodevelopmental disorder that is highly inheritively, you have to seek how do you cope with it? Uh, you grew up uh, knowing that you were expressing symptoms, but you have to cope with that. So what we're going to see <clears throat> is a unique trademark. Is each of us is going to be displaying their mm, disorder in a different way. And the second point I would address is important for me is that ADHD is a highly comorbid disorder. Morbidity is going to be very high. So you're going to express your comorbid disorders and then you're going to be diagnosed by that. And if you are a, a clinician, you're going to be diagnosing it and then you're going to treat it. But that is not going to be a, having a good outcome not always, and they are going to be there, they're going to persist with you until you are tired because they say, you know what, I, I know what to do with this. And then they go to another clinician and they don't know what they have and then they go, go, go until they are tired and they develop this sensation of losing their hope. So uh, it is a very important disorder, affects 4.4% of the population. This is a very pervasive chronic disorder with highly and severe comorbidity that uh, has a lot of comorbidity with substance abuse and then all this mood disorder and the uh, suicidability that they do have and express is a lot. So I encourage you, and this is my message, that we need to pursue a more responsible, ethical, and we need to uh, encourage our responsibility to learn. So this is an invitation. We have to learn and we have to know that it's going to be difficult. But I think the most important thing is to address our ignorance and declare it so we can start this journey of learning. Thank you very much.